Well, the first time I walked up here was in September of 1975 as a fresh-faced sprog with a nice brand new school uniform and a please bully me now blazer. <laughs> it was a time that the Bay City Rollers were having a summer love sensation. But we soon got into the fashions, the, day, the blazers soon got ditched. And one of the first fashions I can remember was the Birmingham bags. Do you remember them? You had the pockets near your knees, so you walked around with like a Neanderthal gait, and you had the big collars. Uh, and the platform shoes, yeah, we had, they were nearly an inch, an inch of platform, but we still played football in platforms and Birmingham bags. It was a brilliant time. And then at 12 o'clock when the dinner bell rang, we'd all charge across here, held for leather, complete with platform shoes, of course, for our dinner. It was like a man start getting for dinner for our, uh, well, whatever school dinners served up for us. And I know that people call school dinners. They weren't bad here, they were pretty good. Well, they did tend to serve red wine with a fish course. And of course, it was so different to our little junior schools that we'd been in. Now here you were, a little sprog amongst 1,200 other kids growing up in the 1970s. And if you've ever watched Willie Russell's Our Day Out, well, we weren't as bad as that, but the fashions were exactly the same and a lot of the attitudes were the same. So you'd gone to being a big fish in a little pond to being <laughs> in this sort of place. And you didn't have play times anymore. No. We had break times. And if you played out like you did at junior school, you were asking for trouble. So we took on indoor sports, basically gambling. <laughs> and the, the game of the day, which was most popular, was, well, it was a bit like bowls, but with coins. So at the back of our classroom, which always seemed to be um, a bit of a magnet for people, was like an area that you, you sent coins down, you slid them along the floor, and it was the nearest to the wall that won. Maybe it was because Morgan Cropper and Jeff Lorber were in our class that, that it, our classroom seemed to be a bit of a magnet for it. But you'd played it mostly with two pences or five pences or ten pences. Now, one day, there was a ten bob do, and I can't remember if it was Jeff Lord or not. It sticks in my mind it was Jeff Lord. And one age classroom became like, well, it was more important than Las Vegas because somebody was having a 10 bob do. And in those days, 10 bob was an awful lot of money. Yeah, 10 bob, a lot of money. In fact, if you could scrounge 30 bob off your mum, you could get on first division football at Burnley in those days. So we entered here as fresh faced kids, as I say, in 1975. And during the next five years, well, we received an education, but this was a secondary modern school. So we were brought up really and educated for life in industry. And in the five years that we were here, <laughs> industry more or less disappeared. By the time I left in 1980, well, there was one pit left, one nationalized pit in the area. All the cotton mills have closed and all that was left really was the, um, was the boot and shoe industry and the beginning of the 1980s and the massive recession and Willie Russell is really a case in point um, if you look at our day out and then look at stuff like the boys from the black stuff now you might think that's exaggerated and yeah he did exaggerate some of the stories but most of it is for real it was a real depressing time when people's lives were destroyed so we came out of here full of exams eight CSEs Eight CSEs, can you imagine that? But you don't even know what a CSE is these days. Well, it's about as useful as a book full of green shield stamps. But there was hardly any industry for us to go into. And really, you know, we had quite a few really good teachers at Fearns. I know people might call the place, but I wouldn't. I mean, people like Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Hughes, they were the Thai Nazis. Where's your Thai boy? But they really were good at teaching. And Mr. Kennedy certainly inspired me with history, as did Mr. Rolls. Um, we had Mr. Vigors for uh, geography. Brilliant. And who can forget Mr. Brannan in the art department there? And we developed, we changed. We went from kids, we've, we formed an identity, or we went to look for something to belong to. Perhaps we became rockers, punks, and mods. And we developed. We developed acne, we had our first crush. And we came to the realization, most of us, that we weren't gonna be pop stars or uh, famous actors. And we looked for serious careers. But we left here in 1980, totally different people 
in a totally different world. And I last walked up these steps on the 30th of May, 1980. And all those years of looking forward to leaving school, it was like a, something that you had around, when we leave, when we leave, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. And you know, it was a bit of an anticlimax. The night before, we'd all been to Manchester Apollo, well, I said all of us, all of my sort of mates and that, we've been to see Black Sabbath with Ronnie James Dio and I turned up on the last day with my Black Sabbath t-shirt. That's kind of how eager I was to leave. I actually came on the last day. And if you look beyond the school on those hills, those hills have been full of industry for hundreds of years and now they were quiet and most of the valley were falling quiet and most of England's machinery was falling quiet. But quite a lot of us did have jobs before we left. We didn't need to see the careers teacher, although we did, which was crazy. But I went into the mining industry and my generation was one of the last generations, if you will, to go into the local coal mining industry. Some from Fearns went to work at Grindbridge because the dad owned it. <laughs> uh, and because it was local in Morgan's case. And me and Tusse, we left here and we went to work for the National Coal Board. So we had jobs long before we started sitting our exams. So what today's programme is a little bit about, well it's all about, is leaving school and what the training was like in those days for us to go into the pits. As the last sort of generation in the last part of the era, you know, we left in 1980 and certainly Parkside was the last coal board pit to shut in the 90s wasn't it round here so we were the last generation to leave but we're going to have a look at what training was like back in 1940 we're going to talk to Steenie and then obviously we'll look at what training were like before that and obviously you know it was non-existent so we're going to have a bit of a journey today through our times of nostalgia particularly it's nostalgic thinking of leaving here in 1980 and then walking down this road for the final time Now, as I said, I left school in May, the 30th of May, 1980. But I got a week off. I started a week late. I got my holidays in Blackpool with my father first. So most of the Valley lads of that year had started the previous week. And it was me and Tony Locke. I forget why Tony was a week late. So it was me and Tony Locke. He was an electrical apprentice at Valley. And we teamed up with two lads. And I think they could have actually been YTS. They were, I'm sure they were at Walkden Yard. Um, but anyway, the first week or two weeks was your induction. Um, and it was very basic. Now, back in the old days, obviously, they left school on the Friday and went down the pit on the Monday with no training whatsoever. But ours, it, the training was... The, the cold boy went to town on training, but ours was really... It makes you wonder if they went too far at times. I mean, it was very basic, as you'll see in this sort of upcoming video, of the lads turning up, they're actually teaching them in a classroom how to put your lamp belt on and put a lamp on. But one of the first important lessons we really learned was that there were two half past fives in one day and Cracker Jack weren't on before the first one. But believe it or not, I've actually still got my induction course notes here from Old Boston from 1980. And you can't get more basic sort of things like my colliery training officer is and you just got to fill in the blanks. Uh, my cooperation is essential during training. Close personal supervision is essential for my own safety and effective training. It is important that I understand how the training centre works and keep the handout for my own guidance. And I have. So here we are in 2022. And I've kept this hand out for my own guidance. But I'm glad I did. Because on this page, it gives our wage scale. And I was 15 and a half at the time when I started. Uh, and the surface wage, because you weren't really allowed to go underground until you were 16. The wage was £43.70 a week. And when you were 16, it rose to £45.30p. And underground it were 50 well, £50, 55p. Now, when you got to 18, that's when it really did kick up. And if you're underground then, you got £82, 15p. And believe it or not, that sounds nothing today. But most of my mates, even going back to the 16-year-olds of 50 quid, And on top of that, was the pit, you got a percentage of the pit bonus. And Apton Valley always had a good pit bonus. So I was always going home heads and tails above the wages 
uh, of all my other mates that got jobs, you know. So it was a good thing. So what was and where was Old Boston? Well, Old Boston was an old colliery by the name of Old Boston, and it was situated in Haydock, which isn't too far away from St. Helens. And the old name for Haydock, or in slang, was Yick. Now, the Haydock collieries are very important pits. There's loads and loads of history about them that we're not going to go into now. But anyway, the old Boston colliery itself, when it closed down and it got reopened as a mining training centre for the northwest region. So all the trainees were sent there. And the idea was you went there to learn your basic training. All the underground training was done at Bold Colliery. So you were shuttled from old Boston to Bold. Now, if you were an apprentice, like I was uh, indentured on a five-year apprenticeship scheme, the idea was that you did your first year's apprenticeship fully at Old Boston, and then as you went through your apprenticeship, you came back to Old Boston to do what's known as trade tests, where you would meet different standards in your apprenticeship on lear learning on machinery. So it was basically an educational centre that catered for the, all the apprentices and the mining trainees. So there was technical workshops, there was training galleries, um, and all the other infrastructure that was associated with it. And this is part of the old winding house, and it's well dated. You've got a, a Rover SD1 there, uh, and is that a, what's that, a Cortina or something? No, it's not a Cortina. But anyway, that was one of the old winding houses from the pit. Um, so that is where we went in these workshops here was the technical department, and that's where we spent most of our first year doing our uh, apprenticeships. And it was manned mostly by old miners that had been, um, well, they'd had various injuries uh, and, and they'd been put in old boss and uh, as a training centre. And when you looked at the injuries, like, like we talk about in the video, we think, well, yeah, did you really want to work in the mining industry? And that's part of the canteen. I wish... I wish I had taken my camera when we when we were there, but I didn't. Uh, the canteen, the cheese on toast was absolutely famous at first break. Proper Lancashire cheese, proper Lancashire cheese on toast. But it went downhill from there. The dinners weren't up too much, I'm afraid. So we spent our first year at Old Boston. And also in line with that, going to Old Boston, before we went to Old Boston, all the trainees from Upton Valley, well, the, the apprentices had gone to Akitech. But old boss and now said, well, we want all the mining trainees, apprentices. And I'm glad they did, because I would have hated that year at Akitech. Because I really wanted to be at the pit. It was bad enough being at old Boston, but at least old Boston was mining. So it related. So the first year we did two days a week at old Boston. Then we went to uh, St. Helens Tech, where we did another two days. And we kind of got day release at the pit. And our class was MIBS D. That means Mining Industries Basic Studies D. So for the first year you were a MIB. And what we did basically at Old Boston uh, as a mechanical apprentice we learned, well, we made a pipe vise and the idea of making this pipe vise was that you used all the different machines, milling machine, lathes, all the different sorts of things you went through to make this pipe vise. And the, but when you got back to the pit, I mean, at Apton Valley, there was a massive mechanics um, workshop, which had every machine you could ever wish to see that could work and turn metal. And nobody used them. The only people that used them were people on the back shift that were making uh, sort of ashtrays and that out of bobbers. Or maybe the car were in for the test, so they were turning stuff down to get the car through the test. Yeah, people used to do that. I remember my dad, uh, he burnt up a washing machine to put on the front of his Hillman Avenger, like the uh, where the bumpers are now. Well, he made one of them out of a washing machine. And they used to swap headlamps with, it, with the Hillman Avengers as well, so each other could get the car through the test. And that's the only time you saw any of them machines working. So before I'd started at the pit, and I was still at school, sometimes during the uh, summer holidays, I'd go and meet my father, because father would maybe up back shift, and I'd catch a bus over, and sometimes take one of my mates with us, my dad would say, oh, fetch a mate with you. So we'd get off the, the bus there at the summit and walk down Rosendale Road, then down Billington Road, which used to be the old Ginny Road. And you'd come down by the cemetery wall, 
And this was more or less the view you would meet because the drift, which you can just see there in the foreground, that there, the cemetery wall is round about here. And that's the view you would see. And you come round the cemetery wall and you could see through the gap at the top of the drift into the drift and go in. And uh, this whole new world sort of greeted you. The smells, it's hard to describe the smells really, the, the pit and everything. And then the father sort of gives a, it were quiet by that time because most of the back shift had come up really. Um, so he'd show me and my mate round the pit top and what have you. And that was a sort of uh, introduction and you couldn't wait to start there. And when I did start, you went through these different, as me and Tussie talk about, um, the intelligence tests and uh, going through the different um, the different stages to actually get a job there. And that's Matt. They were at back of the mechanic shop there. Um, I think that's the stores you can just see through there. This will be about, this will be 1980. Uh, could be 1981. Uh, Matt Conlon there and I did have a picture of myself at the same time and I can't I can't find it but that's how ambitious we were as fitters there can you see he's got his moving spanner that's all the equipment you needed <laughs> and I wish I took more photographs in the mechanic shop you kind of came in this way up the ramp um, and this was the front of the mechanic shop that was like the bait cabin if you will um, and you'll see the pigeonholes later and all above here there was where you, they stored the steel and all different things. And right at the back here, it was a it was massive with, like I've said earlier, nearly every machine known to man that you could use to make things. Now that's in the little bait hole. These are the different pigeon holes. Every day when the mechanics came up and electricians, anybody that had responsibility had to make out a report and even though I've took this with the roller flex, you can't see the names, it's sad. And they would make out the report, even the chalk doctors like George Walsh would come up and they'd pop the report in these pigeonholes and the, the mechanical engineer or his deputy would pick them up and uh, reports would be made out. Now these are part of the old pithead buildings from the early 1900s. The pit had started in 1853, just about 100 yards further down, actually near where the top of the drift was but they'd sunk some new shafts to get to the other side of a fault around about 1910. And this is part of the original buildings. And this is where the mechanics workshop was. You went up that ramp into the mechanics workshop. Um, and they've got an inseam miner here. Now, when I first started, obviously, um, there were no buses. You were lying on lifts. And I remember, like I said, there were two half past fives in a day. And you had to be at the bottom of the road for a certain time. Milne was, I think, one of my first lifts. And Milne came in, he was an electrician, he came in from Whitefield. Um, and basically, you had to be at the, the bus stop outside the Jesses waiting for Milne. And Milne came up out across your brew, the bull brew, like you were flying the, the space shuttle. And if you weren't there, they didn't stop. Same when he came up the pit. I think one of my... Second lift home was with, because um, I started during the holidays, was with Tommy Briggs and Johnny BD. <laughs> anyway, if you weren't through the baths quick enough, they would leave you. They wouldn't wait for you. And I remember once having to walk home over Porter's Gate chain. So we had to find some remedies. And the remedy was in the way of a motorbike. Uh, and it was a Yami FS1E or a Yami Fizz that I bought. And that actually is where I used to park it. Come up the ramp and park it there. And you used to be freezing going over in the winter on a Yami Fizz. They weren't restricted in them days. I actually got 58 mile an hour flat out on the tank going down Rosendale Road on that 50cc, that Fizz. But I remember turning up there. What sort of clothing did you have on? Well, you had T-shirts, jumpers, an exchange of mark down your front and a leather jacket and you get off the bike and you, you your fingers were that numb from coming over Cloudbridge you couldn't even turn the keys off you'd nearly got to get the keys out with your uh with your teeth well, that was all the fun of it wasn't it so that was our start at Apton Valley so let's have a bit crack with Tussie going down Billington Road and uh some memories yeah, if we'd have stood here 40 years ago it would have been different did you used to come over any time when you were at school? Not, not school, no. No. 
Oh, well, during um, school holidays, I used to come with Father Rock oh. back shift and sometimes bring a mate and walk down here. You used to get dead excited walking down here with the fan and look for drift at bottom. Right. So can you remember the first, oh, you can't remember the first day, can you? Yeah, I can't remember the first day of it, but I can remember every day thereafter. Yeah. Well, it wasn't like what it was in the uh, 1930s, finish school on a Friday and end up on a Monday. They wouldn't let us near pit, they wouldn't let us go underground or anything. No. We are off to old Boston, it was, um, it was frustrating really, to be honest. Yeah leaving school to go back to school. school. Yeah, I remember the first, well, we came here for his interview, or intelligence test. <laughs> that must have been a crap intelligence test. <laughs> then we had to come for a, an interview and then a med we went to Bickershire for a medical. I remember us going to Bickershire on the, for, the, for the medical and there was you and me sat at the back of a transit van with no windows in and that's yeah. the first time I've met the rest of the Burnley lads. I think it was Matt Conlon, Tony Locke, and it must have been John and Will, John Pinder and Will Pickard. Yeah. And it was those two quiet lads from Rosendale at the back, and then Gobby Burnley. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what have we come to here? Yeah. And then it was off to Old Boston, wasn't it? Old Boston and St. Ellen's. Did you have um, somebody Valentine? Oh, Val. We had Val. We had Val. There was Albert Ross. Albert Ross. Albert mm. Ross and Artie Farty, who looked like Leo Sayre. Yeah. Um, and then, because we were doing the mechanical thing, there was Mr. Oh, I forget what they were called. Mr. Ashton, um, and then another guy that used to play the drums in the working men's club, and a, a Welsh guy that did the electric and thing. And he could be a, he used to say, you think the coal board holes you were living, lad? And I'm, well, no, you think the coal board holes you're living. You remember all the videos we used to watch, them Super 8 yeah. cine films? I think that valve were actually bragging about one that he started. He was, he was in one, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah, yeah he, he was in one. Didn't he? His mate hit him with a picker, supposedly. Yeah. Supposed to be next. Yeah. yeah. We used to watch all them, and I used to wonder if he really wanted us to work at Pitt, because they just freaking <laughs> you to death. There was one where he was riding the face conveyor, well, the face chain, and he got to the loader end, and he heard this scream, and then you saw a welly and a stump come up the uh, <laughs> stage loader on St. Bell. And that was don't ride the face face conveyor. And there another one with a loco. And it was about always put the handbrake on and walk on the correct path. So this guy got out of a loco that had a full load of mine cars on to open an air door. And he nipped round the front rather than walk all the way around, I don't know, 20 odd mine cars. And he hadn't put the handbrake on proper. And he opens the air door and the, the loco starts coming forward. Yeah. And it traps him between the door on the door frame squeezes his head and his head popped open like a flipping boiled egg. <laughs> that almost happened to me. Did it? It's cropped, yeah. Rushing to the uh, get warm. <laughs> Jumping on man rider in a very enclosed space <laughs> and then they get on and he rolled me alongside the arches. <laughs> and uh, yeah, if it hadn't have been for Dave Murphy, Pulling me in, I'd have been flattened. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had to split. I had like a split leg, like a well proper air leg. Yeah. I'd to have it stitched up. Wow. Well. And shoulder blade at back. That sticks out now. Has done ever since. And I, <laughs> I had to keep it quiet because I'd have been for high jump. Yeah. No, even going to the hospital. I never went to medical. You know, no. Like Showered, home, hospital. That age and, drop? Yeah, that was yeah. age drop. Yeah, and I had to, had to tell Port Pies at the hospital, uh, how you done that? <laughs> and I said, I were, I were doing a job under the car, and the car slipped off, off Jack and drank me down and put me driveway. What's all the cold dust doing in the wounds? Like <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm. Well, that one of the loco always stuck in my mind. It, were, it weren't the loco, what? No. But it was one of man rider carriages. All right. Yeah. Just uh, one of them things. Eh? One of them things. Oh, always wear safety boots. You don't want to be dropping this pork pie on your foot. 
feel way to that pork farm. Wow, goodness me, that's full of porky goodness, isn't it? <laughs> Indeed it is. <laughs> we'll sample that later. <laughs> At Agecroft, they had what, what were called a bobbing cart. It was just a, a bogey, eh? a small bogey, eh? and it had a bobbing on. All his rope, that round fastened at front at bogey and at back at bogey. And whenever they, they did a rope extension, they'd just unclamp the clamps on, wind off a bit of rope, clamp it back up, save actual rope splicing. And, uh, I can't remember district. Something or other return and there was a swilly in it. And there were a, a roller top of arch. And as you know, the rollers are on these brackets. Yeah. To go through holes in brackets and the bottom to the arch. Well the roll, we've been in a swilly. The, the slack rope is giving it that, it used to give it that. You need to go up to the top of the arches. You can see there were rub marks in arches where it hadn't connected with pulley. And what happened? The rope went up and the pulley, the nib end, what were sticking out, the rope got stuck ah. in between that and the arch. And it was just sat there. Quietly going away, I'm a legal man riding as you do, sat on front of the bobbing car, and just get into the swilly, and start seeing from front wheels start lifting up. Looks up, sees where it rolls, I thought, oh, bloody hell, I better leap off this quick. Leapt off, tried to grab the bell line, <laughs> missed it, ended up on a heap on four. Meanwhile, haulage is still going, and it, there were no tackle on, just no. empty bobbing car. And I dropped off the tackle on, way down and up, way back up. And bobbing car, listen, must be a ton and a half weight in them, easy. Probably a lot more when they were full bobbing and rope on. But it just went up in air, smacked the top of the arches spun round and come down with my neck upside down by which time I've managed to grab the bloody bell line and stop it. Oh, lucky escape there. As long as you keep having new do's living <laughs> to tell the tale. Yeah, <laughs> that's the thing. Productivity this year has risen by an overall 4% and despite the recession, which means that industry is burning less, British coal exports have risen to a new high. But it's still men who win coal, and those men have to be trained. As miners win promotion, they qualify in training courses to command increasingly advanced and technically sophisticated machinery. The industry has to look to the future too. Youngsters embarking on a career in coal mining have to go through weeks of basic training. Lound Hall in Nottinghamshire takes up to 300 students. For many of them, the return to the classroom is a bridge between school and working life. But here, theory is mixed very thoroughly with practice. Practice in the procedures that will very soon become second nature to them. There's practice too, still on the surface and in the training galleries, in all the many skills the newcomer to the mining industry will have to master.
So besides going to old Boston a couple of days a week, we also went to St. Helens Tech two days a week during our first year. Uh, after that, it was just day release at St. Helens. And uh, we didn't go to old Boston at all, apart from our trade tests. So this is a, a dinner time out in from Mibs D. <laughs> That's myself. That's John Sim. He were a apprentice. We were all apprentice mechanics, but John was at Parkside, and that's Ian Gormley, Ian Goose Gormley. Uh, now he was Joe Gormley's grandson. He was also at Parkside, and these two lads across the road. One was called was it Martin Critchley? These two lads in the red. They were also. They weren't in our class, but they're in another class. So the the lad on here now. That's Matt Conlon, and Matt was a, a valley lad. Me and him were really good mates. We started together, and Matt was a podium lad. Obviously, back in the old days, there was no, there was no training as we, we, we plain to see, and the training as we know didn't really come in or start to come in until the National Coal Board. So when Steenie Spencer started in the 1940s, now some of you might remember Steenie from a previous video, because Steenie's father worked at uh, Gambleside, and Steenie, when he was about eight or nine, spent half a day with his father down Gambleside Colliery. In fact, his whole family were a mining family. All his brothers went into the pit. But by the time Steenie started, uh, Gambleside had closed and they were at NAB. So I went up to talk to Steenie. I've known Steenie for 40 or 50, over 50 years. Uh, and Steenie now, he's in his 90s, he's 95. He was a really close friend of John Davis. And he started life as a, as a drawer at NAB, Co NAB Colliery in Rosendale. And this is his story of his first day. Right. So what were it like? Can you remember starting well, a bit then, Steenie? Well, I started right at the beginning. Aye. Because uh, I went home from, uh, I told this story, but the old at times. I went home from school. And uh, my mother was, we were at Collins Farm then, over here. My mother was making a bit, a bit of tea, my dad would read it, broad sheet paper. <clears throat> and I said to him, mother, I said, when I go back to school, Mum, I've got to tell the teacher where I'm going to work. My dad never put paper down, he never ruffled it, he just said, tell the teacher when I goes back to school and I go down pick me, I'll be the name down three months. So I left school a couple of weeks before my 14th birthday. But the Monday following my 14th birthday, which was the 29th of September, the first Monday after that, pit with my dad. Right. So off I went to pit with my dad. And we went in a car with John Williams and Billy Place and a couple, Fred Warrington and somebody else. And uh, we walked to, left car at Set Bottom and walked it to a pit top. When we got to a pit top, 
I joined with my dad locker. Yeah. And I got a yeah. locker of my own. And he had my tram ready. He said, that's the tram. And I got the four candles off John Albert Orth. Four candles. And that were my sled. So my dad set off in. And I followed him. And I, and I, I had a job to keep up to. And I, I kept yeah. up to him. Till we, we kept going. I remember going over Clifton because it were brick arch for so far, and then it were normal timber Clifton flat. All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Clifton yeah, flat, yeah. Right. and you went then you went downhill, and the first landing I come to, landing place, you turned left to go up to number one this street, straight on. You went, you know, turn right, turn left to go up to number one, did you? Turn right, you went down to what they call right tax Ginny. So we, we, we passed that place, went over Chain Road to number one, and it kept going and going. It went downhill again and come to another landing, and there were firemen, Jess Russell, and uh, he was sat there in his kiss. At his, yeah. At his, he, 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 he were Jess Russell. But my dad were going up to number three district. Number three went straight on, Abbey Clough went down to the right, number two we went up to the left. And my dad had to leave me there, so he went on up to number three, and with a collier called Walt Fletcher. And he says to Walt, will you look after him? That were me. Yeah. So I said, look after him, and Walt says, follow me. So I followed Walt up to number two district. So it was all really strange, you know, because I, I, I didn't know, we went uphill to it. And, uh, he said, right, well, I'll leave you there. And I went into what, what I got to know at Baytoil until the drawers were sat in there. And there were Walt Fletcher, Jack Lovell. I don't know to look. It could have been Roland Roxton. I, I could have been Roland Roxton and me. And, and uh, Mark Ice was here, Ginny Tenter. So that was my first day. Yeah. And then. Uh, so there's no training then? Oh no, 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 no. <laughs> College, farmer Coop, a very farmer, could have been, I don't know who farmer were then. But it all got his numbers on his, on his sled. Yeah. Beard off, you see. And uh, you, you had to pick which ones you wanted. Now, me, me being a newcomer, I had first pick. Did you? And yeah. I had two colours. Uh, Jim Hayes, and I think we called. Sammy Fletcher. Then, all, then, the, then in order of seniority, the other drawers picked theirs, see. So I was left with them two. But I couldn't manage, could I bugger it? No. <laughs> and, uh, but Mark Hayes, you were giving me a lift. He, he kept me good. Ginny tender. And I'm not far to go to Ginny. So I drew for them two, my first two with Jim Hayes. Yeah. I think it was all Fletcher. And uh, he helped me, did Mark. Now when uh, they let me go out early, me being a newcomer, and they, 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 I went off early and I just stopped at Clifton Flat, but I were let, they let me go, I, I, were, I were a new man, I was, so I went out after a few minutes before I told it, but it only lasted a week. Yeah. Uh, that week, second week, I were in a deep end <laughs> with others. And so, and, and so, I was still a newcomer, so I was still at first week. At colliers, but as you as you get older, you're, other other people started. You 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 went to last week. Yeah. That was the beer lovers. We got last week, and that was my first day. And I'm and I'm paid with that. I don't have to come out early because uh, it were uh, that were not the way. There were, there were no training. You were just told to go, they shoved you in the deep end. Right away, and after that, you're on your own. When I went to the second week over there, I had to pick my colliers. Yeah, yeah. And I know which two to pick. Yeah. But as you, as you went, as you went, as time went on, you knew, you knew we were best colliers. Yeah. And you could look at this sled, you'd have all these colliers numbers on this sled. So and so, Billy Place would be with so and so. He were a good collier with Billy. And you used to think, oh, I'm drawing for Billy Play. He's a bloody good colour, yeah. Billy. You knew you were going to be busy. Yeah. You, know, you might have two colours like that. Yeah. Sammy so Fletcher was a damn good colour. But you, there were colours that, 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 well, like a, I've, I've, I've 
I could have kicked bloody Coyle. <laughs> they, 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 they were, they were, they were, they were they wouldn't have kept a bloody chip on board. No. <laughs> but, it, but that was my, that was my first week. Come out, bass, and that were it. How many, I, how many, what were sort of average count a day for colliers up there, Steenie then at now? They were. What were, what did they sort of average a day up there? Well, coil, the coil varied, as well, you know, but it were all I'm getting. And some coil come easy, but it were, but, you just didn't sit and hit it with a bloody pick. No, no, no. You had to suss it out. Now, coal has a cleat. There's board and end. Yeah. So if you're going, if you're going on end, you're following cleat. Board, of course, you go across ways. But you had to suss it out, the best way to mine it, and the best way to stub it. When you, once you cut a nook on, you drove draw wedges in to bust it off. Yeah. You had to suss that out, and it were all... You had to learn it, learn the bloody hard way. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. They, that's where we went used to go. Yeah. Some colours were good at it. Now that George Cutting, uh, he drove it. Some of most of the roads were border end. Yeah. But they're all places where they're on corner. Ah, uh, we had a few corner aisles at Brig. Well, well main main drift for a corner aisle. Well, George Cutting never drew it, and they were good, mm -hmm. and he could keep it straight. We could call it that. So that was the art of coal getting. Yeah. And I'll drive, I, if you stop and think about it, go and believe it, knowing how long you, you were on the ground or not. I think Rosnell College were the last college in this country. I would say they were. Because um, I don't think I don't think any more after that. Wait. There's still some up at Alston, obviously. But the old hand getters, I would say Rosendale was one of the last areas that they were still yeah, yeah. proper coiling with yeah, the hand. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. Those of a certain age must remember these this bridge, because if you did out wrong, you were sent under a bridge. Don't come back. Yeah, under this it? boundary. Yeah. yeah, looking at that fence. That fence is going to be the back of the compound. Oh yeah, yeah. Without doubt. So far we've drawn a bit of a blank. It looks like where that Eric's unit is, that looks like that was where most of the compound was. You can still see the old fences. And running along here is the old railway line when the pit was running. But there is a bit of a track here. We're going to try and see if we can get back this way and see if we can just see something. It'd be great just to even see a bit of tarmac with a rail sticking out. Right, Dave, what are these for then? Uh, they use them for, um, well, we rotting wood and that, birds will feed on termites and all that kind of stuff, but usually uh, hedgehogs will go in it or weasels, stoats, anything like that, but uh, avoid the prey and predators and stuff like that. Well, there's a pond at back and all in there, what do you think that might be for? That's for attract wildlife, isn't it? Newts, frogs, because uh, it's all been devastated because of this industrial estate, what keeps springing up everywhere. Uh, yeah. Runic countryside, really. Well, this is what apparently worked the old railway line out of Old Boston, but when we were at training centre, there was never, you know, you couldn't see where the old railway line had been. But this is it, according to that guy that we got talking to. Yeah. Makes sense, doesn't it, looking yeah. at it? Makes it look like a prison camp, doesn't it? It does, doesn't it? Called it. Well, this is the nearest thing so far to any remains, this banking. Bits of old concrete sticking out, stones, and a lump of coil. A few lumps of coil in that. Looks like these are the only remains, Dave. It does, doesn't it?
About the training days, weren't you? But something that happened when you got back to the valley. Yeah. Um, yeah, it were Burnley Fair, so there were not, not many guys working there. I think but most of them were on holiday. Um, and I got got put on a job basically, which were deputy travelling mate. So, I look for that. Get to see different parties, but that's what you roll a bank, but you didn't want to be stuck in a classroom, you wanted underground exploring and mooting about. Anyway, he's our Chris Foster, deputy, now he's uh, allocated travelling mate. And, uh, says, right, we'll go and have a look at Dip 5. I can't remember whether it were main gate or tailgate. He uh, went on to do his gas testing and this and the other. It were, were it the last phase? Dip and five were the last right, phase. Dip, five dip were seven were the one that fell in, wasn't it? Yeah. So, but that. That was the the last face to be allegedly. Yeah, it was going to be. Yeah, yeah going to be the last one to be running, and uh, they lost it, didn't they? Because they waited. That was dip seven. Dip five were retreat face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the dip dip seven were advanced. Yeah. Aye, and it waited, and it were well training young lad like. Extremities at the gate. And, uh, I were out by end. I don't know why. I think he must have said, You hang on here, I'll go in and do me. The checks, I can't remember, right? It were odd. E eerily still. But the groans and creaks, noises in the background, and we thought, What's that? No machines, really. Anyway, when it comes out, Chris Foster looked uh, a bit, not frightened, but a bit perturbed. That's the right word. And uh, he says, Come on, we need to be going and quick. Anyway, I find out he's telling me that there's that much weight going on. That the whole roadways shifty yeah. as he's walking, walking on. And uh, I just happened to say, well, it's all the noises we like, you know, machines running. And it turns out they're uh, bolts on arches, shearing, yeah. pinging off. <laughs> There's that much weight coming on in the line. You, well, you're real lads, you know. You don't think of the dangers, and I think at that point I say, we go back down and have a walk. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, the answer to that was no. No. <laughs> ah, this is some of the main dress five. The guard. Oh yeah. Off the uh, off the shearer. What would have gone over it? Shearer disc. Some major wear there. There is in there. Yeah. That would have been kicking some sparks off with sheer effects it in that. And it's not done that way in a couple of revolutions. No, it hasn't, has it? Thought. But do you remember much about Boston then? Well, well we were we were there longer than you because you were mining training, weren't you? Yeah, I, I remember um one of the instructors uh Val. Said, Val. Yeah, Valentine. Well, only a small guy, but uh, a cantankerous, no, no messing about with him. 
But for some reason, he, he took a dislike to me. And I, don't know, I don't know. He happened just thought he had a slappable face. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been summer anyway. But yeah, I got the impression he weren't so keen. There was one day, and because mm -hmm. uh, you used to get an afternoon bit, and they were building a part of the training gallery, like a, I think it was going to be another endless haulage or something. Yeah. And there were some lads, I'll not say which pit they were from, but it wasn't in this country, so to speak, mm -hmm. over a border. And they were trying to knock a hole through the, the, gant the gallery, which was made of brick, it was brick arch. Right. And they were making a right job of it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. you? So me and Matt's killing ourselves laughing at these lads trying to do what they're doing. So Val says, right you burner lads, you can work through your break then if you're so good and show us what you can do. So we, he couldn't have done a better thing. So me and Matt gets up on the top with these seven pound hammers, two lads with seven pound hammers, it was great. We just smashed seven bells out the training gallery. And then when he came back, it was finished. Big <laughs> hole knocked in the side of it in about 15 minutes so that they could, you know, form the junction. And after that, we could do no wrong. Burn the lads, they're great, they can do out for me. Them, them two lads there, they're great. So right. we, we salvaged the, the reputation. <laughs> we kind of suffered, I think, from the, uh, the lads the year before us. Well, yeah, if I remember that, that crew, I were on a training uh, thing down Staffordshire or something, and, and they, they were also on different training thing. It might have been their face training, something to do with that that they were down for. Got banned, kicked out of three, three hotels for kicking off. And there were one place what had rung, they, this were at Agecroft this, and they'd rung, the hotel had rung, Rung bait and said, Don't send any more of them from Apton Valley down here again. They're banned. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to tell us about when you first started at Cronton then? Yeah, I went down pit for uh, an extra five, I was a water by trade. Um, I seen an advert in the Liverpool Echo. Uh, they wage miners want to Cronton Corey. I thought I'll apply. He told me boss likes the air, but no problem. So off I went. Did you have to do any training first, like? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I went to Old Boss and I actually, because I had a bad eyesight problem. I faked my way, I bluffed my way through the training process because I thought, underground, working, I have to wear glasses. So I turned up without, without my glasses <laughs> deliberately, on my medical uh, first. And they give you these block numbers, you know, with all different shades. Of, oh, that, I, yeah, yeah. Remember that eyesight yeah, test? Yeah. They didn't do the letters. No. The, uh, what you get in an optician, they did these blocks. So I, I sort of made out the shades and I got them all right. So, right, that was it. I got through the medical, and that was basically all they were interested in. So I could, you know, because they did give anybody a really job, don't they? You'd I have, know. You'd have to have no legs <laughs> not to get a job. I know I got the job. So, I started off at uh, uh, Old Boston for the, the basic training there for a while, then they sent me to both training galleries. I did a, uh, I think it was four weeks at both training galleries. That was fun. 20 days, eh? 20 it's days, that was it, yeah. I ended, up, uh, I ended up at Cronson. So after a couple, they didn't tell me I had to do night shift. I thought it was only day, and I know that, do night shift. So first, first night on by right Hancock, you're on nights next week. The guy who, who invented nights never, never did it. So <laughs> no, I could never, never get my guts right with night no, shift. Like. I, I was saying, yeah. I'd never get used to it. I ended up the uh, first night there, new boy on the block, you get the worst job of the pit. You clean up behind the belts. You have to keep it clean or go on fire. All oh, right, okay. Well, we didn't have pit work then. All the gold board would give us boots, belts, helmets, everything else you had to provide yourself. So you brought your rags in for home or whatever you had. 
an audible heart turning on doing this job. Against the ventilation, spade on all night long. Well, you've never seen anybody so black in your life in the morning when they got up a bit. They were going through to the showers and oh, hold it, lads. Uh, boilers burst. What are we going to go for? Four showers? No water, you're not getting a shower at all. I said, you've got to be getting on like this. Well, there's no choice. We lived in a flat in Liverpool. Uh, a Victorian type of house. We had the middle floor flat. We had a, a living room, a bedroom, and we shared a bathroom, and we shared a kitchen. Mike comes home, eventually, after the, they had to bribe the poor bus driver to take us because we were that bad. So, first thing I do is pop my head down the bedroom door, check on the wife. Right, mistake that one. She screamed the place down. I tried to calm her down. Someone rung the police. The police turned up within seconds. It was like the Keystone Cop, the awful running in. <laughs> Three vehicles. Dogs and everything. Never! Oh, yeah. Two black Mariahs, police car, and two old riders on bikes. Off they come in, got me on the floor, this time you know, now so much going on, handcuffs me and all the rest of it. What are you doing in here? Well, but I tried to explain, but you know, anyone wanted to decide, the sergeant decided to listen to what I was saying. So he said to one at last, uh, get on the blower to the station, tell them, bring the colliery up and find out what's going on. You know, come back. Yes, it is Mr. Hancock. He was a driver. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Hancock, and off he went. <laughs> I tell you what, it was frightening. You know, it was yeah, really hard be. at the time. Yeah. But it was hard. <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> the wife still, still goes on about it now, and that's for what? 1970? Yeah, 70s. Early 70s, anyway. <laughs>